today's episode of The Story Detective, we are going to be continuing Act 2, Part 2. We're going to continue with the Save the Cat beats from the midpoint up to the end of Act 2. We're also going to be covering for our villain section, the villain's journey. Yes, villains do have a journey too, and we're going to be discussing that in this episode. And there's no better villain journey to use as an example that follows the Save the Cat beats than Darth Vader. As you know, I have a fondness for villains, and you've probably seen some of my toys in past videos. I also have other toys, although this isn't technically a toy that you would find in most toy stores. It's more of a realistic prop replica. It does function. Oh my god. <laughs> and it's very loud. I think we should uh, put this away before somebody loses a hand. <laughs> okay. So that's what's coming up on today's episode. Stay tuned. The midpoint is another shift for your story, and your character is going to be discovering new things and also reacting to new things on a different level. Dividing that middle into two equal sections and realizing that the midpoint is going to be another shift, I think that helped me immensely because once I started dividing things into four equal quarters rather than the long middle and the two smaller quarters or thereabouts at the end, I really started to see those shifts and come at stories in terms of four smaller journeys rather than having that long desert to cross in the center. And that brings us to beat number four. What is the midpoint? Save the Cat says the midpoint is a crossroads. It's where there's either a false victory or a type of defeat. What happens here is your hero usually sees that the problem is much bigger than they realized. Getting over to story engineering, they call it a glimpse behind the curtain, a reveal that shows that that problem that they were looking at previously was only a small slice of something much larger. It's a reveal. It is another inciting incident, and that inciting incident gives your characters more things to react to. In Star Wars, it's when the Millennium Falcon comes out of hyperspace and they look like they're in a meteor belt, and it turns out to be the planet Alderaan, which was their destination, and now it's blown to bits. They also also see what looks like a small moon that turns out to be the Death Star, and they're caught in a tractor beam and pulled in. So there's a lot going on, but it shifts things. Whatever your character was doing up to this point, they just got a very rude awakening. It always raises the stakes. It always ups the danger. It always turns out to be something that was very unexpected. Fiction thrives on surprises, and this midpoint should be a doozy. As Save the Cat puts it, the shift also cues those inner wants that your character has been trying to struggle with is now shifting into exterior need mode. So they're saying it the same way that Story Engineering says it, but in a slightly different way. So the more you understand structure, the more you come at it from different angles, you'll see how to play things up differently. And that's why I'm comparing these things a little bit for you guys. Not to defame Save the Cat, which is a really good book. There are many, many ways. Now, Jessica Brody herself has said that coming at structure, for some people, they deal with it as the beats are written. And some people people interchange those beats and they manipulate them and turn them into an art form. The depth of your villain defines your hero because they represent a reflection of everything your hero has to overcome within themselves. If they can't overcome those inner demons, if their dark side becomes their dominant nature, then what we have is the villain's journey. Remember when we said the best villains could almost be your hero? And how a wrong turn could incite those inner demons rather than overcoming them? Let's begin with a bit of background. I think most people have a general knowledge of Darth Vader, the cyborg villain from the original Star Wars trilogy, which ran from 1977 to 1988, and who also happens to be the father of the hero, Luke Skywalker. I am the father. No! Yeah, you saw that one coming. And am I the only one who feels like Mark Hamill resembles a young Stephen King in that shot? Moving on to the prequel trilogy, from 1999 to 2005, we see Anakin before he becomes the villain. In fact, he starts out as the hero. 
the beat five is called the bad guys close in because the bad guys usually are closing in they are symbolic of the problem getting worse and whatever the problem is has now metastasized and it's gone from the internal and that's why most stories have an exterior villain because at this point whatever they were doing whatever the conflict was between the hero and the villain up to this point the villain has been several stages ahead of your hero and now it looks like the hero has caught up with them and that's really going to piss the bad guys off so that's why in this beat in this section of the story the bad guys are really going to try to squash the hero this comprises the third quarter of your book the second half of act two when you're getting into the bad guys closing in this can take many different turns getting back to story engineering in this quarter what larry brooks refers to this is your hero is getting their inner hero on in other words they're dealing with some of those internal problems so that they can face the villain whether this quarter of your story has physical contact with the villain or whether your hero is preparing for that physical contact some stories they're running from the villain some stories like rocky this is the part where he's training for the big fight with apollo creed and this whole quarter is that training session we may see apollo creed being very confident maybe even putting rocky down but mainly the fight hasn't happened yet but your hero is getting their inner hero on so they could be training they could be doing research they could be doing a number of things because in this bring on the bad guy section also according to story engineering the rise after that false defeat your hero may be having to build themselves up or maybe they're putting the pieces together and realizing their victory was false but especially if it's some kind of a false defeat your hero has to rise from the ashes of that defeat this is where they're getting stronger in the bad guys closes in beat in star wars it's literally where they cross paths with darth vader for the first time so the bad guys are closing in literally they've met the opposition and the opposition has also met them. In the first of the prequel films, we saw Anakin as a little boy. If we look at Act 1 setup in Save the Cat, Anakin is in his status quo of life, which is a slave. He's smart and tech savvy, which is used by his owner for profit. He knows nothing else, but much like his son Luke, he dreams of being a pilot and seeing the stars. His inciting incident comes when he meets two of the Jedi Council. Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi, who discover Anakin's metachlorines level are off the charts. The force is strong within the boy, and when Qui-Gon decides he wants to train him, there's immediate hesitation from the Jedi Council, who sense his deep-seated anger will be difficult, if not problematic, under their order, which prides itself on being peacekeepers. Anakin also meets his mentor figure in this beat, as well as the love of his life, Padme Amidala, but is seen at this point to be a child's crush. Anakin crosses the threshold when the Jedi bargain with his owner and take him from his home planet, Tatooine. At this point, the story follows the same beat as any hero would. Anakin's shard of glass is apparent. We know there's anger in him. His journey and our curiosity has begun. Like all good fiction, we want to understand why and how he got to the point that we saw him in the original movies. And that can mean they are suffering some kind of death of a loved one. Like in Star Wars, Obi-Wan sacrifices himself so the others can get away. The death of the mentor is a big part of this beat because now your helper, your teacher is gone. Something often happens to them in this beat. Jessica Brody points out that no one usually changes until they hit rock bottom. And that's what this beat does. The all is lost brings your hero to a rock bottom moment. That rock bottom moment is often the death of someone. It could be a literal death, it could be a symbolic death, but somehow along the way in this all is lost moment, something is going to happen that makes your hero feel like it's it's hopeless no matter what they do they couldn't possibly get beyond this problem they've lost that death of the mentor is usually symbolic in how that makes them feel because if their mentor who is training them can't actually overcome the problem how are they set out to sea and they're sailing in a boat completely on their own now 
Save the Cat also suggests that whatever happens here that brings your hero to that rock bottom place, the hero is somehow responsible for it. They have no choice at that point but to face that inner demon because now, in a sense, they failed themselves. So unless they overcome that, take responsibility for it, nothing can happen. But they are made to feel responsible because if you're not feeling responsible, how can you take responsibility? When Qui-Gon is killed by Darth Maul, Anakin's apprenticeship is taken over by Obi-Wan, who offers to teach him. The Jedi Council reluctantly agrees, still citing his anger and fear as potentially dangerous. Their own fear and disapproval of Anakin is a constant in his life. He's treated differently, and for the next 10 years of his life, he's fighting beside the Jedi. And this fits perfectly into the fun and games beat of Save the Cat. All the while, he's struggling with his inner demons. He's headstrong and doesn't really follow the rules. In fact, sometimes when his emotion gets the better of him, his actions are more suited to an anti-hero. And while the Jedi are always disapproving of his methods, he also catches the attention of Chancellor Palpatine, who says he'll be watching Anakin's career with interest. Approaching the midpoint for Anakin is exactly 10 years later in the second film, when he meets Padme not as a child, but as a young warrior who wins her love. This is an important moment because we see Anakin has not outgrown his childish crush, in fact, he's become a bit possessive and single-minded about it. We also see that he's a bit hungry for more, more power, more everything. This is the mark of a great passion that has not found fulfillment. He's unhappy with the Jedi Council. They aren't allowing his career and his merits to move forward. And when his mother is kidnapped by Tusken Raiders and dies in his arms, we see how fine a line there is between love and hate within him as he kills her captors in what can only be described as a massacre. This is the midpoint moment when we see the darkness within him is much larger than we previously imagined. What is the Dark Knight of the Soul? This is where your hero contemplates whatever happened, the death of their mentor. They are putting the pieces together and they're trying to figure things out. It's another period of debate and that debate is going to help them put those pieces together that they've collected. Story Engineering, on the other hand, calls this plot point two. Now they're in their best condition that they've been, they're ready to face the villain. It could be a piece of evidence found that now may compromise the villain. They found something that might turn the tables. They haven't used it yet, but it is a turning point that now victory may be in sight. Again, the more you know, the more options you have for your story. Save the Cat calls the Dark Knight of the Soul the wallowing beat. Your hero is either mourning the loss of their mentor, or maybe they're getting really pissed off and angry about it. But whatever it is, it's taking them into the next level of contemplation the next level of searching themselves so that the interior problems can be resolved so they can resolve the exterior problem, which is always a direct reflection of that interior. They have to overcome themselves and the darkness within before they can overcome the darkness without. The second half of act two, or the third quarter of any story in the hero's journey is typically portrayed as a descent into darkness, a place where they will ultimately come to terms with those inner demons. For Anakin, the descent doesn't end happily. He is married to Padme by this time, and she's pregnant. He is plagued with visions of her dying in childbirth, manipulated by Palpatine that the only way to save her are through certain Sith practices, which only he can show him because he's secretly the Sith Lord Darth Sidious. Anakin is conflicted. He tells Jedi Master Mace Windu, who tries to keep Anakin out of it when he confronts Palpatine. But Anakin does what he always does and ignores his superiors. Showing up, he finds Palpatine feigning helplessness as Mace Windu stands over him, lightsaber in hand. Palpatine tells Anakin Padme will die, and that possessive passion, whatever it is that he's hungering for, leads him to make a choice. Was he always going to make that choice? It seemed like Palpatine didn't have to push very hard to ignite his hunger for power by this time, because he slices through Mace Windu's hand. This is what Save the Cat would call the Dark Knight of the Soul moment, and he chooses anger instead of overcoming it, a reversal of the hero's journey, but a life-changing moment nonetheless. The fourth quarter, Instead of the hero riding into battle to confront the villain, Anakin is the villain, confronting the Jedi Council and killing them all. Finally, he confronts Obi-Wan, his friend, teacher, and mentor. You were the chosen one! 
It was said that you would destroy this and not join them! Spoken like a true reversal. Obi-Wan defeats his former student, leaving him for dead, but Palpatine rescues what's left of his body and begins rebuilding him. Padme does indeed die in childbirth. Palpatine delivers the final blow by telling Anakin he is responsible for her death, that he killed her when he was enraged. There's nothing left for Anakin, and not much left of him physically either. Darth Vader is born, and this is the mirror image, juxtaposing the awakening of the villain that he becomes over the little boy that we saw in the first image. Until next time, keep those keyboards clacking. May the dark side, I mean the force be with you.